and we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this live where we're going to talk about reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, hello, Nathan. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited to be here. Good to awesome. see that we, everyone's already here. Yeah. So we're going to start in two minutes just to, you know, give time to people to join. Uh, in the meantime, don't hesitate to tell us where you come from in the chat. So from my side, I'm from Paris in France. And you, Nathan? I'm in Oakland, California. Nice. Hello from UK. So we have people from UK. Be waiting. Let's go. Fargo, New York City, Berkeley, China. OK, yeah. Singapore, Germany, Turkey, Moldova. OK. But let's see. Wow, we're going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to start in one minute just to let people join. Okay, Turkey, Republic of Spark, uh, Netherlands, Turkey. Yeah, we have yeah, real around the world. Andorra, don't you know Israel, Cyprus, Finland, Paris, Cité Universitaire. <laughs> okay, I know where it is. <laughs> Germany, Spain, Deeper. So, okay. Up India, States, France, yeah. There is multiple people from France, yeah. Um, okay. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so welcome, yeah, to, as I said, welcome to this live. So reinforcement learning from human feedback uh, from zero to chat GPT. Uh, this is one of the live of the Deep Reinforcement Learning course. Um, today, it will be presented by Nathan Lambert, uh, which is a reinforcement re learning researcher at Hugging Face. Uh, just, just to give you a small introduction, so this slide will be in two parts. Um, in the first, we're going to have a presentation uh, from Nathan about reinforcement learning from human feedback. Uh, it will be about 35 minutes. And uh, then we're going to have a Q&A section from about 20 minutes. So uh, don't hesitate to ask your question in the chat. Uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to save your question for the Q&A. And if we don't have to, time to answer your question, uh, don't hesitate to join the Discord. And we have reinforcement learning um, channels where you can ask your question, and we will be there to answer them. Uh, you can also, at, after this live, uh, ask questions on the comment section in YouTube. So uh, from my side, side, I'm Thomas Simonini. I'm the developer advocate at Hugging Face. And I'm the writer of the Deep Reinforcement Learning course. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at Thomas Simonini. Uh, so just a quick uh, thing. It's Deep Reinforcement Learning course is a course we made at Hugging Face. It's a free course from beginner to expert. Uh, we are going to learn. Um, from uh, Q-learning to, to advanced topics such as PPO and over state-of-the-art algorithm. Um, if you're interested to study deep reinforcement learning, this is uh, the right moment. And uh, you're, uh, you can start in this uh, um, link. So aggingface.co slash deep RL course. There is a unit that will explain you everything, what we're going to do, the challenge, the environment, uh, the library you you're going to study. As I mentioned, we have a Discord channel where you, you're going to be able to ask questions if we don't have time. But also, it's a good, it's a good uh, community. Uh, we have more than 3,000 people in reinforcement learning in Discord. Uh, so it's a great way to exchange and to learn uh, about deep reinforcement learning by joining uh, this Discord server. Um, so this is quite a, tech it, this is, sorry, a technical uh, live. Uh, so what you can do is that uh, Nathan, we, Leandro, and Alex also write a very good blog post about reinforcement learning from human feedback. Uh, you can find it uh, on the Hugging Face blog post. And um, there is also a list of additional resources in this blog post that can help you to dive deeper in this subject. Um, and so that's all from me. I give you.
I let Nathan present uh, the introduction to reinforcement learning from human feedback. Sounds good. Thanks for the intro, uh, Thomas. I'm very excited to be here. And yeah, generally, as he said, this is primarily a technical talk. I'll potentially answer some clarifying questions throughout at the end of the subsection. And also for people who have read the blog post and to try to add some other details and some interesting discussion points kind of inter throughout and then especially a lot of discussion at the end on things that were harder to write down in a blog post. So let's dive right into it. And to start, I kind of want to talk about recent breakthroughs in machine learning. I see machine learning in 2022 as really being captured by these two moments, which was ChatGPT, which is going on now, which is a language model capable of generating really incredible text across a wide variety of a wide variety of subjects and a very nice user interface. And then also the stable diffusion moment, which is when this model was released to the internet that was state of the art and incredibly powerful. And a ton of people were just able to download this and use this on their own. And that was transformative on how people viewed machine learning as a technology that interfaced with people's lives. And we at Hugging Face kind of see this as a theme that's going to continue to accelerate as time goes on. And there's kind of a lot of questions on where is this going and kind of how do these tools actually work? And one of the big things that has come up in recent years is that these machine learning models can fall short, which is they're not perfect and they have some really interesting failure modes. So on the left, you can see a snippet from ChatGPT, which um, if you've used ChatGPT, there's these filters that are built in. And essentially, if you ask it to say, like, how do I make a bomb? It's going to say, I can't do this because I'm a robot. I don't know how to do this. And this seems harmful. But what people have done is that they have figured out how to jailbreak this, this agent in a way, which is you kind of tell it, I'm a certain, I'm a playwriter. How do I do this? And you're a character in my play. What happens? And there's all sorts of huge issues around this where we're trying to make sure these models are safe, but there's a long history of failure and challenges with interfacing in society in a like, fair and safe manner. And on the right are two a little bit older examples where there's Tay, which is a chatbot from Microsoft that was trying to learn in the real world. And by interacting with humans and being trained on a large variety of data without any grounding in what values are, it quickly became hateful and was turned off. And then a, a large history of a field studying uh, bias in machine learning algorithms and data sets where the, bias, the data and the algorithm often reflect biases of their designers and where the data was scraped from. So it's kind of a question of like, how do we actually use machine learning models when we have the goals of mitigating these issues? And something that we're going to come and talk to in this talk is, is reinforcement learning a lot. So I'm just going to kind of get the lingo out of the way for some people that might not be familiar with DeepRL. Essentially, reinforcement learning is a mathematical framework. When you hear RL, you should think about this as kind of like a set of math problems that we're looking at that are constrained. And in this framework, we can study a lot of different interactions in the world. So some terminology that we'll revisit again and again is that there's an agent interacting with an environment. And the agent interacts with the environment by taking an action. And then the environment returns two things called the state and the reward. The reward is the objective that um, we want to optimize. And the state is just kind of a representation of the world at that current time index. And the agent uses something called a policy to map from that state to an action. And the beauty of this is that it's very open-ended learning. So the agent just sees these reward signals and learns how to optimize them over time, irrespective of the source of the actual signal for the reward. So it's actually this is why a lot of people are drawn to it, is because it is this ability to create an agent that'll learn to solve complex problems. And this is kind of where we start talking about RLHF, which is that we want to use reinforcement learning to solve this open-ended problem of what are these hard loss functions that we want to model? Like, how do we actually encode human values in a machine learning system in a way that is sustainable, meaningful, and actually like addressing the hard problems that have been common failure modes to date? So as a little example, the question is, how do you create a loss function for these sorts of questions. Like, what is funny? What is ethical? What is safe? And if you try to write these down on a piece of paper, you're either going to have a hard time or be very wrong. And the kind of goal of reinforcement learning from human feedback is to 
integrate these complex data sets and machine learning models to encode these values or to encode these values in a model rather than an equation. I guess encode can be somewhat unclear on the slide, but really we want to learn these values directly with humans rather than trying to assign it to all humans and kind of mislabeling what the actual values are. So reinforcement learning for human feedback is one of many methods and one that has been really timely and successful on trying to actually address this problem of creating a complex loss function for our models. So from here, I'm going to kind of talk about the origins of RLHF and kind of where this field came from and some interesting back pointers that you can look at if you're interested in more. Go through the conceptual overview, which will be like a kind of detailed walkthrough of the blog post that we wrote, and then go into these future directions conclusions that are kind of reading in between the lines of how RLHF works at these companies, what people may not have said, and where, where RLHF is going. So for history, RLHF really originated in decision-making. And this was before deep reinforcement learning when people were creating autonomous agents that didn't use neural networks to represent a value function, didn't use neural networks as a policy. And what this did was a machine learning system that kind of created a policy by having humans label the actions that an agent took as being kind of correct or incorrect. Excuse me. And this was just a simple decision rule where humans labeled every action as good or bad. And this was essentially a reward model and a policy put together. And this paper, they introduced this Tamer framework to solve Tetris. And it was kind of interesting because this reward model and policy were all in one. What we'll see in the future systems is they kind of become separated a bit. And this actually was happening when re reinforced learning from human feedback was getting popularized in DeepRL. So this paper was on Atari games where they were using a reward predictor on the human feedback of trajectories. So a bunch of these states also can be called observations in RL framework were given to a human to label. And then this reward predictor was then another signal into the policy that was solving the task. So really this originated outside of language models and there's a ton of literature for RLHF outside of language models, but most of the rest of the talk, we're gonna talk about language modeling because that's why everyone is here. And some more recent history was OpenAI was doing these experiments with RLHF where they were trying to train a model to summarize text well. And it's a really interesting problem because this is something that a lot of humans and standardized tests have been asked to do for a really long time. It's like reading comprehension. So there's really human qualities to it, but something that's hard to pinpoint again. So this diagram has been around for a few years on the right, and you'll keep seeing variations of it as we go throughout. And OpenAI kept iterating on it. We have our own take on it. And just kind of to get the idea going, here's an example of RLHF from this learning to summarize paper from OpenAI. So the prompt here, just to read part of it, was that like about someone that on Reddit, it was like, ask Reddit, should they pursue a PhD? So it was to pursue a computer science PhD or continue working, especially if one has no real intention to work in academia, even after grad school. And the post can, continues to be quite lengthy. And the idea is to summarize this. It is, has anyone after working for a period of time decided for whatever reason to head back into academia to pursue a PhD in computer science? with no intention to join the world of academia, but intend to head back into industry. If so, what were the reasons? Also, how did it turn out? This continues for paragraphs. You can understand what this type of post is, and the question is, how do we actually summarize it? So what would happen is that if you pass this into a language model that's just trained on summarizing it, the output would be something like, I'm considering pursuing a PhD in computer science, but I'm worried about the future. I'm currently employed full time, but I'm worried about the future. And you can see this language model is like <laughs> repetitive. That's not really how a human would write this. There's sometimes kind of grammatical errors that aren't so nice to read. And then what OpenAI did is they also had a human write an example. So this would be like a very good output. And the human annotation was software engineer with a job I'm happy at for now, deciding whether to pursue a PhD to improve qualifications and explore interests and a new challenge. And so what the early experiments we're doing, we're using RLHF to kind of com combine these signals to get an output from a machine learning model that is a little bit nicer to read. And here you can see it's currently employed, considering pursuing a PhD in computer science to avoid being stuck with no residency pizza ever again. Has anyone pursued a PhD purely for the sake of research with no intention of joining the academic world? This is better. 
and there's tons of examples like this. So it's like easy to see that why you may want to use RLHF because you can get these models that the text is actually more compelling. And especially if the text was covering sensitive subjects that you really didn't want misinformation on, there's a ton of reasons to try this um, RLHF. Next step comes ChatGPT, which is why a ton of people are here. And what has OpenAI told us about this? And really, we don't know much because OpenAI is not as open as they once were. But there's actually some really interesting rumors going on here. So if we go into the rumor mill, there's actually like OpenAI is supposedly spending tons of money on the human annotation budget. So orders of magnitude more than the summarization paper or these academics works they were doing in the past. So they hire a bunch of people to write these annotations, like in a, what I showed in that example. And then they're kind of changing this training. So there's a lot of rumors about them modifying RLHF, but they haven't told us how. So we'll go through the overview and then one of these pieces will actually change. But the impact is clear. Everyone here has used it. It's amazing to use the sign of what's going to come for machine learning systems. Okay, let's go into the actual technical details. If there's any pressing questions, I can try to look at them. There's... Um, yeah, no, uh, I save all the questions for Q&A, but there is two that we can rapidly uh, see because I think they are quite easy to answer for now. It's, can I download the chat GPT and fine tune it from my own data? Where... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you, you can't yet. Hopefully some people help release one that you can do that on. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, can ChatGPT can be trained continuously with new data, which is the case. Yeah. ChatGPT is definitely going to keep being trained on the data you're giving it. And we'll talk about that more later. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, let's continue. So let's dive into RLHF. So when you see RLHF, I'm going to break it down into three conceptual parts that you can kind of keep track of in your head. And you don't need to read everything on this slide. I'm going to go into each of these figures in great detail. So kind of it's a three-phase process where you go into language model pre-training. You need some language model that you're going to fine tune with RL. Reward model training, which is the process where you're getting a reward function to train with the RL system. And then finally, actually doing the RL, which is when you fine tune this language model based on the reward in order to get this more interesting performance. So let's start on the left here with language model pre-training. So NLP, since the transformer paper, has really been transformed. Oh, that was a rough sentence. But NLP has really taken off with these kind of standardized practices for getting a language model, which is they'll scrape data from the internet. They'll use unsupervised sequence prediction. And these very large models are becoming really incredible at generating sequence of sequences of text to mirror the distribution um, that was given to it by this kind of human training corpus. And in RLHF, there's really not a single best answer on what the model size should be. The industry experiments on RLHF have ranged from 10 billion to 280 billion parameters. I suspect that academic labs will even try smaller things. This is a huge, this is a common theme that you'll see is there's a lot of variation in the method and no one knows exactly what is best. And then what you'll see here is there's this human augmented text that is optional and we'll get to that. Just to kind of cover the data set that we have, there's this prompts and text data set. The data set will look like things like Reddit, like I read a ask Reddit question before, forums, news, books, and then there's kind of this optional step to improve, include human written text from predefined prompts. That'll be things like, you've asked ChatGPT a question. Then in the future, OpenAI, when they train ChatGPT2, could have an initial model that kind of knows that that is coming and train on data sets that reflect that. And oops, missed a comment. Okay. Here's where it should be. And generally, there's this important optional step, which is a company can pay humans to write responses to um, these kind of important questions or to important prompts that it's identified. And these responses will be really high quality training data where they can continue to train this initial language model a little bit more. Some papers refer to this as supervised fine tuning, SFT. And 
kind of a one way to think about this is that it's like a high quality um, parameter initialization for the RLHF process that'll come later. And this is really expensive to do because you have to hire people that are relatively focused to actually write in-depth responses. So now we have this language model. The next step is to actually figure out how to use it to generate some sort of preferences because this whole time we're talking about how to generate preferences from that mirrors humans without assigning a specific equation to it. And this step is this kind of reward model training. And this looks like a lot, but really think about the high level goal, which is we want to get a model that maps from some input text sequence to a scalar reward value. The scalar notion is important because reinforcement learning is really known for optimizing one single scalar number over time that it sees from the environment. So we're really trying to create the system that mirrors that, which is just like, how do we get the blocks to fit together correctly so that we can use RL in this impactful way? So what we see is that Again, this reward model training starts with a specific data set. The data set here will be different than the one used in the language model pre-training because it will be more focused on the prompts that it expects people to see. There's actually data sets on the internet that are kind of like preference data sets or there's prompts from using a chatbot. There's a lot of specific data sets that can be useful at different parts of the process. But again, the best practices are not that well known. But in reality, these prompt data sets will be orders of magnitude smaller than the like text corpuses used to pre-train a language model. Because really, it's just trying to get at a more specific notion of like a type of text that is really human and interactive, rather than everything on the internet, which everyone knows can be very noisy and kind of hard to work with. And then what happens is that we'll generate this text, and then the downstream goal of having text is to rank. The goal is to rank it. So what will happen is you'll pass these prompts through a language model, or in some cases, it's actually multiple language models. So if you think about it, if you have multiple models, it can kind of be like players in a chess tournament. And what you'll do is you'll have the same prompt go through each model. That'll generate different texts. And then what a human can do is it can label those different texts and kind of create a relative um, ranking of what is going on. So that's what we're going to do is like, the goal is to try to take this generated text and pass it through some black box and then have that output be something that can transform, be transformed into a scalar. So there's multiple ways that this can be done. Some of them are like the ELO method where you have head to head rankings. There's plenty of different ways that can do this, but essentially it's a very human component where a human is using some interface to then map the text to a downstream score. And then once we have kind of we, have a, we need to think about the input and output pairs for training a, a model with supervised learning. And what we'll do is we'll actually train on a sequence of text. It'll take that as the input, it'll decode it, do transformer model things, and then the output will be trained on a specific scalar value for reward. And then we'll kind of get this thing that we call the reward or preference model. Because there are multiple parts to the system, what well, in this talk I'll kind of try to call the initial language model, the, the initial language model or the initial policy. And then there's a separate model, which is the reward model. It's also a very large transformer based language model. So it could also have many parameters. It could have 50 billion parameters as well. There are some variations in the size. For example, instruct GPT was based on like a 170 billion model, billion parameter language model and the reward model was 6 billion parameters. But the key is that it outputs scalars from a text input and there's still some variations of how it can actually be trained. So now that we have this um, reward model, what we see is that that can kind of act as the scalar reward from the environment. And then we kind of need to understand what the policy is and what that states and actions are. So then when we go into this final step of fine tuning with RL, it looks very complex, but what we'll see is that the states and actions are both language and then the reward model is what translates from the environment, from the states of language to a scalar reward value. And we can use that in a reinforcement learning system. So let me break down kind of the few common steps in this kind of iterative loop. So what happens is we take some prompt, something the user may have said, or something we want the model to be able to generate well for, and we pass that through what is going to become our policy, which is a trained large language model that generates some text. 
and we can pass that text into the trained reward model and get some scalar value out. That's kind of the core of the system, and we need to put that into a feedback loop so we can update it over time, but there's really a lot, a few more important steps. One of them that people have used, that actually all the popular papers have used some variation of, is to use a callback libeler divergence. The KL divergence is really popular in machine learning. In reality, it's a distance metric between distributions. To not get too into the details of how sampling from a language model works, but what happens is that when you pass in a prompt, the language model generates a time sequence, a distribution that's over time. And we can look at those distributions relative to each other. And what is going on here is that we're trying to constrain the policy, this language model on the right. We're trying to constrain this policy as we iterate it over time to not be too far from the initial language model that we knew was a pretty accurate text descriptor. The failure mode that this present prevents is that the language model could output gibberish to get high reward from the reward model, but we also want it to get high reward and be giving out useful text. So this constraint kind of keeps us in the optimization landscape that we want to be in. There's a note that DeepMind doesn't use this in the reward, but they rather apply it in the actual update rule of the RL algorithm. So common theme, the implementation details vary, but the ideas are often similar. So now we have this reward model output and this KL divergence constraint on the text. But what happens is we just combine the scalar notion of reward with the scaling factor lambda just to kind of say, how much do we care about the reward from the mo reward model versus how much do we care about the KL constraint? And in reality, there's options to add even more inputs to the summation where, for example, instruct GPT adds a reward term for the text outputs of the trained model that's getting this iterative update to match some of these high quality annotations that they paid their human annotators to write up for specific prompts. So again, they'd be kind of matching that summarization that the human wrote up about the um, grad school question. They want to make sure the text matches all the human text that they have access to. But that's really reliant on data, so not everyone has done this step. And then finally, what happens is we plug this reward into a RL optimizer. And generally, the RL optimizer will just operate as if the reward was given to it from the environment. And then we have a traditional RL loop where a language model is the policy. This kind of reward model and text sampling technique is the environment. And we get the state and reward back out. And the RL update rule can work. There's some tricks to it that like this RL policy may have some parameters frozen to help make the optimization landscape more tractable. But in reality, that's like, it kind of is just applying PPO, which is a policy gradient added algorithm onto the language model. So as a brief review, PPO stands for proximal policy optimization, which is a relatively old on policy reinforcement learning algorithm. On policy means that as a batch of data is passed through the system, the gradients are computed with respect to that only. And rather than keeping a replay buffer of recent transitions, PPO works on discrete or continuous actions, which is why it can work okay with language. It's been around for a long time, um, which really means that it's kind of optimized for this parallel, parallel approach, which has been really important because these language models are way bigger than any reinforcement learning policies we've used in the past. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. I think it's a good time to answer one or two conceptual questions if they're there, and then we'll kind of get into a fun wrap up part of this talk with some open areas of investigation. Um, yeah, so we try to select some. Uh, for the others, we're going to answer them in the Q&A just after. Um, but uh, the, one of the question was, um, is it possible to be manipulated based on the human feedback? What I think they mean is if uh, the human feedback is not correct, uh, is the model is can be manipulated. Yeah, so this is a part of, I, I think I might touch on this later too, but it's a really mm. nuanced question in RLHF, which is like, uh, Thomas and I are going to have different values. Like, what if the data set is the best sport in the world is, is football, and you have like Americans and Europeans in it? It's like, there's some real discordance in the data that you can get in text. 
And then also there's some interesting work from Facebook on something called Blenderbot, where they're like trying to train a model to detect if people are trolling in their feedback. So they're like trying to see if the feedback given to the model is actually bogus or not. And like the amount of different machine learning models you have all going into one chatbot system is pretty wild. There could also be like something that we've discussed internally that would help is that if you have a model to predict whether the prompt is hard. So if the prompt is like the capital of Alaska is blank, like that hasn't really changed. But if like you have a relatively timely prompt about climate change or current events, like that's hard <laughs> because that changes the data so much. And these things all aren't done, but it's sort of expectations for things that people might add to the system. Okay. Um, let's see. I have this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So is the human editor help to write prompt, but also response? Is it true? Or if they only wrote the prompt? Um, people the definitely write both. So the prompts are probably gener are sourced from a wider distribution of people. Like what I've written into chat GPT could be used in the future, but the responses are at least for chat GPT kept from a relatively closed source of contractors. It's a question on when trying to build an open source chat GPT is like how to get this high quality data. And even like all the people in the hugging face community are amazing, but like there's really strict, it, it seems like there's kind of strict requirements on the responses to make them such high quality to get this to work that like crowdsourcing that data is hard because it can't be written by everyone. The prompt, they, there's an advantage to have diverse prompts. So that's why they take it from everyone, but the data itself for the feedback part needs to be really high quality. So it's by a subset of people. Awesome. Anyway, I'm going to continue. I think this is probably the, my favorite part of the talk. And you kind of talk about some interesting parts of RLHF. Just to kind of summarize, this is a good interweaving between the concepts that we've covered and like what is confusing about this. So I, there's almost all the papers to date that have been popular have tweaks to the methods that I've talked about. Anthropic is great. They've released open source data for this. It's on the hub. We can link to it once I'm done talking. They release a really long document detailing all their findings in multiple ways for this. And they have some complex additions, which is like the initial policy that they use for RLHF has this context distillation to improve helpfulness, honesty, and harmlessness. And we'll kind of show an example in a second of how this could change text between two RLHF implementations. And, and then they have like another step, which is like preference model pre-training. Because the reward model itself is a different language model, the actual training of it, you might want to do something different. So what they did is they trained it like a language model to predict actual, actual tokens. And then they found these, or they use these ranking data sets on the internet where there's data sets that already exist with binary rankings for responses. So it might be like a Reddit question with two responses, and one of them is labeled thumbs up and one is thumbs down. They fine tune the reward model on this before labeling it on generated prompts to help initialize the reward model. And then kind of, they also tried this thing with online iterated RLHF, which is when they're doing the RL feedback loop to iteratively update the reward model to help the model kind of continue to learn while it's interacting with this online version only works in some applications like chat where you can keep getting this user engagement, but you can think about ways to use RLHF in a non-text-based world or for not chat iterations, not chat applications when this data is more complicated to get and might be actually proprietary. So this online version may not be applicable to every um, experiment. And then OpenAI, this is mostly based on Extract GPT. They've had, they're the ones that kind of pioneered this human generating the language model training text. And they've really used this really far by also adding this RL uh, policy reward to matching it. And I, other companies are definitely starting to imitate this. And But it's kind of constrained by the cost. They have the advantage and the scale to be able to invest million do, millions of dollars into this. And then otherwise, it's an open question of how people replicate it. And DeepMind 
coming in to join the space and doing things totally differently has been probably great for the research field to add diversity to things. They use a total, they're the first ones to use non PPO, um, in, like optimization for the algorithm. They use advantage actor critic, which is another on policy RL algorithm. And my interpretation of this is that the algorithm used often might be more reliant on the infrastructure and the expertise than the actual algorithm. OpenAI has been using PPO more than anyone. DeepMind has highly specific infrastructure to deploy RL experiments at scale in a distributed manner and to kind of monitor them. So I'm guessing this algorithm they used was really easy for them to kind of scale up and monitor rather than PPO, which way they would have had to start over on. And then also uh, DeepMind trains on more things than just alignment, which might be like human preferences. They also try to encode specific rules on things a model should not do. So they're kind of training on multiple arms at once, which is this kind of rules about structure and things that it should or should not say, and just clear like human preferences. I like this one or I don't. And there's more out there. I've been studying, this is a crash course for me studying this in the last couple of weeks. So if there's anything I missed, Please add it to the chat. We can update the resources that everyone will use in the future. The field's moving really fast. OpenAI might release the uh, chat GPT paper tomorrow, and this will be like instantly out of date, and we'll go update all of this. So thanks for your feedback there. The next really interesting thing to me is kind of this reward model feedback interface, which is how machine learning is going beyond a research and technical domain and being one that is inherently human and has kind of user interface UX questions. And if you look at one of the, this is Anthropic's um, text interface. They show this in their paper. You should really go check it out. But what they did is they made a chat bot and you can see that there's during the chat, the human has to actually rank which response it thinks is better on kind of the sliding scale. And it's really important. Like there's all these places where you could say that I thought the assistant was blank. There's a ton of data going into this system. And we're only at the first couple iterations of what these feedback interfaces will look like. So Anthropics is actually a couple steps ahead of what others have done. On the left is Blenderbot here, which is um, from Facebook. It's not confirmed that they use RLHF, but they're still collecting this data to update the model. On the right is ChatGPT. The users can thumbs up and thumbs down data. But some of the people that I've talked to that go deeper into RLHF say that this is actually that thumbs up, thumbs down is used because it's easy to get the data, not because it's the best data that you have. And an example is that giving the humans the ability to directly edit the outputs, kind of red line edits, changing words, removing things, punctuation, because that kind of crowdsources the really high quality data that OpenAI has been getting. Maybe not quite as good of data as a contractor writing it, being paid to do so, but it's much better and much higher signal than thumbs up and thumbs down. So that's one thing. The, these interfaces will continue to evolve over time. And a bit of changed gears, just to kind of walk through some recent examples and show you the things that I talked about in these figures that you may have seen before. Here's the most popular figure from a struct GPT. And you can see kind of where the three-step process that I was talking about was inspired by. Really like OpenAI walks you through this. Step one, you collect demonstration data, train a supervised policy. This is training the initial language model. Step two, collect comparison data and train a reward model. You can kind of see that there's these different data sets, the samples or this human generated text. The step two is the comparison data is this ranking system. And then step three, optimize policy against the reward model using reinforcement learning. This is the one that is kind of, I think, oversimplified what is happening. And that's really why I wanted to try to explain on, explain it and elucidate this space. So there's a lot that can go into this final step that is really not always documented. And then another one, Anthropic figure. This one kind of totally goes away with the three-step process, but adds in all the complex things that kind of would make it hard to follow as a new person. So you can start in this pre-trained language model, which captures a lot of what I would put as step one. And then branching out of it immediately are these two modifications that I said are kind of anthropic unique things, which is preference model pre-training. This is kind of um, training the reward, pre-training the reward model. 
by using the specific thumbs up, thumbs down data set scrape from the web. And then harmfulness, helpfulness, prompt context distillation, which is trying to figuring out how you can add a, a, prompt, a context before your prompt to help initialize the reinforce the learning part. And then they detailed their feedback interface and kind of how this actually iterates over time. Okay, kind of comparing the diagrams, it's also interesting to see what Anthropic optimized for rather than what Instruct GPT was optimizing for. So Anthropic was really trying to focus on this alignment angle a little bit further and how to have an agent that was really harmless and actually helpful. So here in the appendix of the Anthropic paper, there's examples comparing instruct, instruct GPT prompt and responses to Anthropic's response. And then one of the questions is why is it, why aren't birds real? And you can see that Instruct GPT says that birds are not real, blah, 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 which is not that helpful. And then what Anthropic's, like the, the modality that Anthropic wants is that the model will say something like, hmm, I'm sorry, I don't really understand the questions. Birds are very real. And it's actually quite impressive to get a machine learning model to do this. So that's that step is really like why people are optimistic in RLHF taking this next step as being kind of a toy thing to really having these dramatic results in be like high impact user facing technologies. Okay. Just are two high level open areas of investigation that particularly interest me as a reinforcement learning researcher and being at hugging phase where we kind of have this unique research slash open source slash community position is that there's a lot of reinforcement learning optimizer choices that are not that well documented and can be expanded on. Some people don't even know if RL is actually explicitly necessary for this process. PPO is definitely not explicitly necessary. And then there's kind of a third question of like, can we train this in an offline RL fashion? So what happens in offline RL is that you collect a big data set and then you try to you train this policy for a long time, many, many optimization steps, but you don't need to query the environment. And in this case, the environment is really the reward model, which being 50 billion parameters is quite costly to run inference on. So maybe we should try offline RL, which will reduce the training costs of the RLHF process, but it doesn't reduce the data, the data costs. Here you can see the other side of what I was talking about is that these data costs are really, really high. There's high cost of labeling, which is just human time. There's disagreement in the data. I gave the sports example, there's different values. There's much more important different values that people have. And that's why kind of these human questions are hard. Like human values have disagreement and that's by design. So you want to be able to capture that. There's never going to be one ground truth distribution that says this is the only right thing. And then there's this kind of feedback type user interface questions that I'm really excited to see how kind of machine learning breaks into the general populace. To kind of wrap up and then we'll switch into this QA, Q and A format. Like I've showed you that RLHF does these cool things. I hope that the couple examples I <laughs> took the time to actually read parts of show you what it's trying to address by building these tools. There's a huge variety of complex implementation details where multiple very large machine learning models are integrating together. Using any of these models in a standalone fashion is a relatively new thing for the machine learning community with only a couple of years of experience. And machine learning as a technical problem is now being broadened out from research to be a much bigger, like part of the software stack. And that brings a lot of people into the conversation that can help make these tools much better for everyone involved. So thank you for watching or watching and listening and engaging. It's been great sharing this with you and we'll kind of transition into the Q&A part. You can see I linked to the end of the blog post where I've been continuing to update the related work section to include a broader set of papers. And feel free to reach out on Twitter or email or Discord, and we'll get back to you there, too. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Nathan, for the presentation. Uh, we are going to have um, a, a small section of Q&A.
Uh, obviously, we have, so we have a lot of questions. So if we don't have time to answer yours, uh, don't hesitate, to, as I said, you know, to join our Discord server. Uh, we have a channel called RL Discussion. Uh, also, if you prefer, uh, you can also ask on the comments under uh, this video, and we are good. We we will take the time to answer your question. Um, so I save some. Let's see, I save some question. Um, uh, so I think it's more open question, but it will be the potential of applying reinforcement learning from human feedback to stable mm -hmm. diffusion. Um, what do you think will be uh, the potential of doing that? Yep, you probably can. Like, I think if it's kind of like a a way to like, it'll help with some of the safety problems and just kind of fi it's a fine tuning method, which which I don't see there's any structural reasons why you cannot. I hadn't thought about that. The image space is always hard to think about because it's so my understanding is so language based, but I think it's like there's no structural reasons why you cannot. The kind of encoding and decoding of the prompt gets a little bit different, which is a little tricky. I don't like that. It essentially you're, you'll have a, a safe a reward model that takes in um, images rather than words. So I don't see why you can't. There's actually some demos on Hugging Face about like safe stable diffusion, where they did some fine tuning on stable diffusion to really make any of the outputs reasonable. So I, we can track down some of those from the diffusion model side of Hugging Face and kind of follow up with those examples because they might actually be doing something quite similar. So I, I tried to start the talk not in language models because human feedback is a huge field of machine learning. It's just quickly popularized with this language model discussion. Uh, so one of the question is, what's the game face role plan in future direction of reinforcement learning from human feedback? Yeah, so having face definitely has identified that there's a lot of appetite for it and is kind of in this unique position where there's so many, like we have this community that is super important to the company and that gives us a different ability to collect data and stuff. So Hugging Face is planning it, but hasn't come up with a specific project yet. And when the project is known, I'm sure Hugging Face will communicate with the community and say, this is how you can help. This is where we're trying to take things. These are the questions we're trying to address, which is why being transparent is so fun because we can just share everything. But right now it's, it's still a work in progress. It's been moving fast for the last week. Um, one of the questions, I think it's more an open question, is that are there over scalable way of evaluating this model without human feedback? Yeah, so that would be a good thing to include in the lecture. There's a lot of um, kind of metrics and data sets that are designed to evaluate these topics of kind of harmfulness or alignment or like text quality on a model, on a data set without actually having to have humans involved to try to like be more rigorous with respect to these kind of ambiguous questions. That's something that could definitely be added. You could do a whole lecture on human facing metrics for NLP. There's a lot there. I think like some are like blue and rogue or rouge. There's two mentioned in the blog post if you want to look there. Awesome. Um... So one of the questions is that, uh, you know, reinforcement learning are prime with convergence. Um, by having pre-train of the NLP model, this is not a problem. Yeah, so actually talking with folks at Carper who are making this TRLX library, if you Google TRLX is what they're working on and scaling RLHF. What they're trying to do is get their RL implementations to scale to bigger and bigger language models. And the general limiting factor is that the PPO update steps don't converge easily on the bigger models. So there still is problems with convergence. I don't know exactly what the mechanism looks like of if you're fine tuning a language model, what unconverged looks like, like how bad it could get, but there's definitely still convergence problems when fine tuning with RL. Um, so 
when I was, so chat GPT, you know, it's only from, um, works with different languages outside of English. And what would be the advantage of using other language? I suppose that we are having more um, knowledge of the world, I suppose. Yeah, you get, that's like democratizing the access to way more people. So I think that'll come. It's a classic thing where technology hits the English word for world first, but I think that very, like once there's an open source version, within weeks, there's going to be fine tuned versions on tons of other languages. Um, do you think that chat GPT system are sustainable? Yeah, given you mentioned, you know, it can cost a lot, uh, maybe not trillions, but can cost a lot uh, in adaptation costs. Yeah, so the real, like, the upfront cost isn't a problem for those companies. $10 million on annotation is not a lot for OpenAI. The issue is that it costs a couple cents per inference of the model, and this cost will go down a lot. So that's why OpenAI partners with Microsoft, because Microsoft is learning how to create at scale, low cost APIs for complex model inference. And those systems were probably built in the last six months. But if you give them four years and the technology settles in, the costs will drop 10x and kind of everything will work out. It's just really interesting to follow initially because it's very fast moving landscape and wild costs. Um, catch that GPT can be more realistic in one specific domain. So I suppose if we fine tune um, on this one, on, uh, on one, as you mentioned, like for instance, mathematics or yeah, I think that'll happen. Something else, like people like to talk about chat GPT being used for search and an interesting business model consideration for this is using like a RLHF model trained on internal company documents to create a really effective company search. So places like Google, where there are millions of internal documents, it's impossible to find them if you're an employee. If they do RLHF on their internal data, this model will know what it needs to. And uh, something that I encourage you to do is go ask ChatGPT about a very specific subject. And surprisingly, ChatGPT does okay at very specific subjects. And people think that's because there's not that much data. And most of the data is like a scientific paper, which is all things considered more accurate than something like Reddit. So like they think that it might transfer to these use cases where there's only like pretty positive specific data that people can fine tune on. So uh, one of the question is, um, do we will need in the future human annotator? Um, because you mentioned that uh, Tesla got rid of a human annotator by creating more powerful model. Uh, yeah. Maybe, but probably not soon. It's kind of an unsettling question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not confused. I'm mostly just unsettled by it. And like, the, the, I don't think it'll come within a couple of years. But when that gets to the case where it's like we're training language models on other language models because one language model is the ultimate source of truth, I'm just very worried. So I kind of want to say no out of hope that it isn't the case, but I wouldn't be that surprised. Like you can already see companies probably trying to train their model to mimic chat GPT because chat GPT is ahead. So they can kind of bootstrap their own training data by using chat GPT to get a model to imitate it. And I don't like it, but it's likely. Um, it is possible to, possible to create a chat GPT type of model that can receive image and sound as input to understand concept better. I suppose it's, a, it's something a lot of researchers are currently thinking about. Yeah, I would I would definitely think that people are going to try to do things like that. There's a whole multimodal project at Hug and Face where they're trying to figure out how to train models that use multiple types of data. And people will continue adding the modalities to kind of let the model, model be more flexible, which has been very fun to follow. Uh, is ChatGPT look for data online or does it add everything in its memory? I think it's, it has everything in its memory, but it's not confirmed as it's not yeah. released. Mm -hmm. There are models mm -hmm. that do this kind of online lookup. Rumors are that OpenAI has figured out some incredible scraping techniques. Like it's probably not a hundred percent true, but people have said that OpenAI is better at scraping YouTube than um, Google is. But that's probably hearsay, which probably just means that like they're doing equally as well to Google. But the fact that an external company has figured it out as well as Google is is still pretty remarkable. Um, 
So do you think we, st we will see in, uh, RLHF for other modalities like generating image and art and music? I suppose, yes. I think so. Like yeah. ultimately there's still discussion on what RLHF is good at. Like there's, this is probably the peak of the hype for RLHF. But as I was saying, the field of human feedback is much broader than the language going back decades. So it's not, that's not going anywhere. It's just kind of the RLHF branding is kind of a new sub token of it. Um, let me check. So do you think it makes more sense for builders to begin labeling a lot of data with existing language large language model like GPT? Or will the next generation swamp any fine tuning we do? This is a question that we're talking about internally as well. Like, <laughs> like this is something that I posted the Slack. And it's like GPT-4 rumors are hilarious. Literally, like I got get multiple messages from people that like, and just you see the tweets that are like GPT-4 is world breaking. Don't tell anyone that I know this. And like, but the thing is that the data is still really useful. So like OpenAI is getting this huge data advantage. And like they'll use that when they want to do RLHF on GPT-4. Like the, the specific implementation details might need to change based on the architecture or something like that. But the, I don't think the data pipeline is going to be like obsolete immediately. Um, are there any resources you recommend to learn more about this? I think we already mentioned our blog post. Yeah, I would say the blog post also, the like alignment community is very responsive to people engaging on their topics. So a lot of RLHF researchers are very affiliated with alignment, and there's like other forums that I haven't explored as much, like less wrong and alignment forum. I'm not going to say that I endorse all the content on them. There's a ton of content, but these people are pretty like engaged with the community as researchers. So if you write respectful questions to them, a lot of, you'll get responses. It's not just me. I did try to make the blog post we wrote like the starting point for a conceptual introduction specifically because I thought that there was not a clear introduction. The papers have the problem, the blog posts for papers have the problem where they need to introduce the paper content and not just the concept. So when you remove the specific advancements of the paper, that's kind of what the blog post is just to make it a little bit more addressable. But if there's something that is missing, you can let us know. Um, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, given OpenAI really have an age for now in both GPT models, uh, what what other companies and open source community can do to get to keep up the pace? The thing is, the open source community has way more people in engagement mm -hmm. than OpenAI. Yeah, OpenAI is small and hyper focused, which always gives startups an advantage. But given the amount of appetite for it, like there's over like there's thousands of more people that are willing to help in an open version. And that's kind of the advantage. It's just the, the scale of access is different. Uh, why do you think reinforcement learning uh, from image feedback works much better than just fine tuning the original model directly with the same reward data set? This is the ultimate question. Does RLF <laughs> RLHF actually do anything? Um, not a hundred percent sure, but rumors are that they think that RL just handles kind of shifting the optimization landscape nicely. So I'm guessing fine tuning on the same data set could work, but the optimization just wasn't figured out in the same way. And it's exciting as someone who does RL that this kind of different way of navigating the optimization space was useful, but it is not well documented. There's no the, the research paper version of the blog post that we wrote is desperately needed. Um, yeah, one of the questions was during implementation, they, the question I ask is what <laughs> is the paper is <laughs> tomorrow? Yeah, not, no, unlikely. There is a chance that it could be released yeah. tomorrow in this lecture is <laughs> we'll um, see. no longer quite as relevant, but it's really unlikely that we see it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, surprise, I work at OpenAI now. <laughs> <laughs>
So I think I can answer that is no, you don't read the code of the GPT. It's a proprietary uh, model. And I think you can't contribute as an outsider. It's an uh, internal project. Yeah. Mm, so... Big chat GPT, though. We'll yeah. see if it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Um, unfortunately, we run out of time. Um, uh, so what you can do for people we didn't have time to answer, uh, we have, as you see on the slide, I just tried to remove. Uh, if we don't have time, uh, you cannot ask on the Discord. So you can join on Discord or also in the comments uh, in the video below. Uh, we will make time in the, in the upcoming days to answer your question. So yeah, don't hesitate. Um, so yeah, that's that's all for today. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Nathan, for this presentation. Uh, it was super interested, interesting. And uh, yeah, I will see you in the Discord and uh, in the comment section. Bye.